Good afternoon, everybody on the East Coast, and good morning to everybody on the West Coast. This is Brian Ankney with Auto Success Magazine. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to join us today for this webinar. Um, hopefully, if this is your first Auto Success webinar, you enjoy what you see and you join us again. And for those of you who have been here before, welcome back. Uh, today, we have a great set of guests. Uh, they, I call them a pair of aces. We've got Anthony and Anthony. Anthony uh, Greenhalt and Anthony Martinez from Rapid Recon. We're going to be talking about the new school of reconditioning. And for, for those of you that, that, are, that are new to tracking your reconditioning, we've got some stuff for you. For those of you that have been at it for a while, we've got some stuff for you. And for some of you seasoned pros, we even have some, some new ideas and new tactics for you to get your cars frontline ready quicker. Now, before we get started, a couple things I'd like to go over with you, just a little housekeeping. Uh, the way that we're going to ask questions on this webinar is you will type them in, and then at the end of the webinar, we will, I'll read them to our guests, and our guests will give you answers. Now, I ask you to please type your questions in as we go, because that'll help me with a little context as to what the topic was when you typed it in, just in case, you know, as the webinar goes on, that question might pertain to one or two or more topics. That'll help us to speed it along a little bit. Um, now, how do you ask questions? If you're on a laptop, a tablet, or a desktop computer, it's very simple. That, that little go to webinar window that goes down the right side of your screen, near the bottom it says questions. To the left of questions is a triangle. Click that triangle, it'll open up a, a place for you to type in your question, you hit enter and the question has been submitted to me. Now if you want to chat with me during the webinar, you can go ahead and use the, the button right below that for chat. If you have a question or something technical, you can't hear or something like that, I'll, I'll do my best to help you. Um, now, if you are on a smartphone uh, or any other mobile device, there's a couple different ways it could work. It, it, it varies based on manufacturer. You might have a header, a footer, or a picture frame around your screen. And somewhere on there, you'll see an icon that looks like a question mark. Just touch it. It'll open it up. You type in your question, submit your question, <coughs> excuse me, and when you want to come back to the webinar, some devices let you swipe, other devices let you, you have to touch a second icon, which looks like a, like a desktop flat screen monitor. Now, a couple, a couple of times, you know, due to technology, due to internet, due to whatever, I've had people get kicked off and, and ask how to get back in. It's actually very, very simple. The same link that you use to join us will bring you directly back into the webinar should, for whatever reason, you get disconnected. And the same phone number and code that you dialed in on will actually bring you right back in as well. So, you know, with that being said, I would like to turn the floor over to our guests, and I hope you all enjoy this presentation and learn a whole lot. Anthony and Anthony, take it away, my friends. Great. Well, thanks, Brian. So, uh, my name is Anthony Greenalch. I am a process performance manager with Rapid Recon. I am a 25-year seasoned veteran of the automotive industry, primarily in fixed. I was a parts manager, and then for the last 10 years, I was a collision center manager for a dealer. Uh, one of the things that got me most interested in reconditioning was uh, internalizing cosmetic. I, I really got tired of seeing the uh, the bumper guy out in the parking lot, and the PDR guy out there, the windshield guy, and I just knew that we were hemorrhaging money and uh, figured out a way to internalize that business and bring it into the store. Uh, Anthony, I'm going to turn this over to you. A little flip slides there. Hello, I'm the uh, other Anthony. I'm Anthony Martinez. I have a little different background. Uh, I was in the United States Army. From there, I went to, into home construction, where I was introduced and started getting certified in quality control, lean, and Six Sigma. Uh, from there, I went into uh, reconditioning, um, and I became the reconditioning center director for Greenway Auto Group and ran three stores, about 1,500 cars a month. Um, what I focus on is uh, process implementation improvement and how to be an agent of change and make that part of your culture. So that brings us to uh, our next slide, and uh, common recon problems. These are commonalities that we've seen uh, with our customers and through our own experience. You've seen it too, I'm sure. Bad communication, finger pointing, taking too long, bottlenecks in your process, overcomplicated workflow, not knowing where something is, car, repair order, keys. And just the complication of manual tracking, not making it easy for someone else to just jump in and, and see what you're doing because yours is so specific. 
So, uh, Mr. Obvious here on the screen, I, I've got a little comment that a lot of you probably know, but we thought we'd bring it up anyway. Uh, that it's not uncommon to hear an unfavorable comment about pre-owned vehicle reconditioning, especially from a fixed operations manager. Uh, after all, they've got a lucrative customer pay business to run and, and don't necessarily have time to focus on all of this internal stuff. Uh, the fact of the matter is that internal work can take twice as much energy and return half the gross if you're doing it wrong. So defining measurable, defining measurable industry standards. So inventory holding costs. Current holding costs about $37 per day for non-luxury, and luxury brands run upwards of $50 per day. Holding costs are figured as the fixed cost of the used car department divided by the number of cars. Average days in recon. That's how long the vehicle has been spent being reconditioned. Time to market is the time from acquisition to e-commerce marketing, which many stores will perform before the vehicle makes it to the mechanical reconditioning. Time to line, that is the time from acquisition to frontline arrival. We still see stores that will hold off on the minor cosmetic reconditioning until the frontline is ready because it's convenient for the vendor. So keeping track of all this work can be a big task, even in the lower volume stores, and keeping it flowing makes all the difference. The fact is the cost of reconditioning a vehicle increases the longer a vehicle sits. And these are the metrics that we use. All right, just some uh, quick examples of those things that we brought up so you kind of have a, a scope of, of what we're looking at or what we're measuring when we're talking about those industry standards. This is a, an example of a holding cost calculator. And these are NCM's numbers. These aren't ours. These are actual numbers that come out of stores. So NCM says the average store has a daily holding cost of $37, all right? And the average store says they're 12 and a half days time to line. Wow. Uh, but everybody would like to be at five. Um, there's a seven and a half day spread. The average store has 150 cars in stock. Do that math, 41 grand in a month that the stores are just spending keeping those cars in the reconditioning process that they could eliminate. And amortize that out over a year or, or uh, compound it into a year, just shy of half a million dollars. So when you look at the impact of what what is a day in reconditioning, what's well, 5,500 bucks? What's three days? 16 grand? What's five days? 27. It's huge money. So you know uh, when dealers are starting to prioritize this stuff and coming to their department heads and departments, and they're going, "What's the big deal now?" This is the big deal now. This is why it's so important. And uh, you know typically we've seen store we've seen stores as high as 22 days time to line. Uh, not not great, but certainly people that need some help. Uh, average starting store that starts out is about 10 days and then after about five months uh, we see stores get down to that five day range and then have some people that are very focused working well down in the, the two two point four day range so uh, last topic on those uh, those three metrics a, a quick graph here just so you can get a visual on um, um, where these things lie this is a, a timeline from acquisition all the way through to the time of the frontline arrival you probably can't see, well, you probably can see my mouse. I'll bet you can. So uh, acquisition to time to line is all the way through the process. Now we used to refer to time to market as time to line because that's really when we went to market. That's not the case anymore. You know, market is e-commerce and a lot of stores, they'll bring a vehicle in uh, uh, from acquisition. First thing they do is they detail it and they get that, uh, get those photos of them, get that vehicle online. Now, those stores that are doing that need to be good with the reconditioning process so they're not setting appointments on cars that are going to be in reconditioning for the next 10 days. They just end up costing themselves a deal. But once they've got it tightened up, they'll move their detail and, uh, and photo process up front. And then the other metric that Anthony brought up was ADR or average days in reconditioning. And that's really from uh, the point of uh, that the vehicle gets turned over to fixed or to the time that it gets back to variable. So those are those metrics. All right, uh, and just some uh, brief uh, comments on uh, managing uh, managing your average station reconditioning and what some of the benefits can be. Uh, it's when your time to line decreases, your gross increases as a result of expense reduction. Um, time savings, time is actually real money here. It's no secret that a vehicle sold in the first 30 days of acquisition holds a higher gross margin. Uh, increased inventory turn, dealers are doing more with fewer vehicles uh, and they're wholesaling less. And, and uh, think about this for a second. If you cut two and a half days out of your reconditioning process, you get a full inventory turn out of that. What could that be worth to you? 
Um, knowing where the cars are uh, eliminates waste. And waste by waste, what I mean is time. Um, think about you know people running around trying to find out where cars are, and not just salespeople or or, or sales managers, but also flat rate technicians. I mean, when they're running around looking for cars, they're not making any money, so you're not making any money. Um, yeah, measure what you can manage. Um, belief without evidence is not for the workplace. So, uh, and then also powering um, personal responsibility throughout your empowering personal responsibility throughout your your process. Avoid preaching to the congregation that we simply need to get better. Uh, you really need to know who and why and when and how much, and uh, and who's responsible here. The future of reconditioning, and that future is the reconditioning center. What you want is an isolated department, a recon bubble separate from the other parts of fixed operations. Dedicate a staff to handle only the internal work. Find a technician that can also be a mechanic and fix something that your master tech would normally replace. You want to have a dedicated internal manager, internal service writer, technicians, parts counterman. If you have a dedicated process, then they can be held to a separate standard and they can have a higher workflow. Ask your parts counterman to shop for parts. Instead of rolling out a one option, well, do you want it or no? you? Have a, a good, better, best option with time frames, shipping, next day option, maybe even a regular part versus this can make it certified pre-owned. But you need to have a dedicated department with shared resources, but think of it as a third branch of fixed operations, service, parts, and reconditioning. And and just a comment on that, Anthony, um, and, and you guys, this doesn't have to be a separate building. I mean, not everybody's got a, a great big checkbook where they can just write a check and, and build a separate building for this. You can incorporate this into your, you know, your current service buildings, your parts departments, your service drives, uh, but, you know, just be mindful to have a dedicated process. doesn't necessarily need dedicated real estate. Um, and then, you know, going, moving on. Uh, one of the uh, one one of the uh, aspects in here uh, adjust your your process to compensate for lead times. Um, order windshields, tires, or other items that are quickly. Um, um, what am I looking for? Uh, you know, items that are going to cause you big delays in, in your process. Stuff that you could get done, um, get get done, and get there there quicker. You also want to identify things. Going back to parts, you want to identify what costs more: a cheaper part or longer shipping versus cutting days out of the schedule. I just saw that on eBay for $200. Can you guys match that? We've all heard of that. So weigh your holding cost versus the savings of an economical or recycled part that is two to three days out. Is it worth the cost of express shipping to eliminate a day's worth of holding cost? So if the part you found on eBay is a savings of $100 and it's five days out, by the time the part arrives, you've wasted $185 in holding costs, not to mention the opportunity of customers actually test driving the vehicle. We'll flip the screen here. All right, so I've just brought up an example of, um, well, this is actually a, a menu price of an, a, a, a business that has internalized their cosmetic reconditioning. Uh, and if if I can urge any of you to do that, I, I would say to, to go ahead and do it. You may not be aware, but you, you can uh, take a technician, send him to school. Uh, they will provide tools, two weeks worth of training, lodging uh, for about 10 grand, which is, is quite reasonable. Um, you know, stores are, are earning that back pretty fast. It doesn't require that you actually have a body shop either. Um, there are some body shop operations in here. This particular example came from a store that did have a body shop, so they were able to paint. Um, but you know, outside of that, a lot of stores don't actually have a body shop, but there are a lot of operations in here that you could handle. Um, in, interior repair, for example, or um, um, windshield trip repair is, a, is an excellent example. But uh, you know, internalizing that can be huge, huge, huge uh, amounts to your, to your bottom line. But not just not just adding internal gross to fixed. The big advantage here is getting the car to the front line uh, in five days or less. But getting it to the front line when it's sensory ready. Or, and, and by that, what I mean is, uh, you know, somebody could sit in a car and it doesn't smell like cats. You're not going to lose a turn or lose a deal because your car was on the front line, but it certainly wasn't ready. So that's the big advantage of, of internalizing this. There may even be operations on this list that somebody will look at, uh, and you know, let's use interior repair as an example. Um, I actually, actually did this in the store that I was in. Didn't make a dime on interior repair, but 
we had to do it so that we could get those vehicles to the, the front line in, in five days or less. I didn't lose money on it, but you know, it was a break even um, a deal for me. Rather than sublet it, we had those cars ready when the customer showed up. Another approach is variable detailing. So standardize how you guys want to divide the detailing assignment and cost and charge to, to uh, the sales department. Don't just have a flat, okay, to detail a car, it's going to be this amount every single time, and detailers sometimes wins and sometimes they lose, depending on how much they have to work on it. Actually, triage it. Do it treat it like you would an inspection. I have an example on the screen of a cosmetic inspection form. I actually trained our technicians at the store I was at to uh, do this as part of their MPI. And what they would do is they would identify, based on different standards, how many stages of work it would take on the inside and outside. Maybe a trigger would be a buff versus polish or interior trigger would be if you see dog hair or sand. And then you know when you get this form as a detailer, well how much work am I going to get paid for it? What do I have to do? What tools do I need? What training do I have to implement? From the sales point of view, they know how much they're going to spend on the car. And they get winners and losers. Those purchase vehicles that came great, those might just be a stage 1-1. One, one. But sometimes, uh, you know, you got that minivan of the family that lived in it, and that might be a 3-3. And, and so they're able to actually apply a little bit more um, specificity to what goes into the detailing. And on the detailer's end, he knows exactly what's going to get paid, and he's going to know what, he's, uh, what tools he's going to need. Also, you might find yourself being able to squeeze in a couple more details. Let's say it's 4 o'clock, and the detailer's going to on his way out. There's no way he can start another car. Well, now you can just flip through these pages and find another a stage 1-1. One, one. It's only going to be a couple hours. Hey, you can knock that out before you leave. So think how many more cars are going to get into the cycle in, in the production line when you do variable detailing. You know, and one thing I wanted to mention uh, with this is we actually we have a few stores that have Im implemented this. In fact, quite a few uh, as far as getting the cosmetic, cosmetic in inspection done during the, the MPI. Uh, now, what a lot of stores will struggle with is taking a technician that hasn't done cosmetic um, in inspections up till now, and now we're going to say, well, we need to add this to your workload, and we're not going to pay you anymore for it. Um, the, the store that, that I want to bring up as an example that was very successful, they put an additional three-tenths on their MPI, which is, I think it's it's $22, and they said it was well, well, well worth it to know up front what they were getting into, so that, you know, the $22 investment that the sales department was making to understand how bad is the cosmetic. And, and they've they preached that it's got them out of some situations where they might have uh, mechanically reconditioned that vehicle only to realize that the cosmetic was so bad that the vehicle should have been wholesaled. Well, now they're going, well, the, cos the, uh, the mechanical's already done. I'm this far into it. Go ahead and do the, uh, you know, the cosmetic reconditioning, and, uh, and I'll try and sell out of this. Knowing that stuff up front has, has helped them avoid some big wholesale losses, so it was a good investment for them. And on that point, just think about it. You've already got a trained technician who's spending up to an hour inspecting the vehicle, walking around it, looking at it with detail. Why not add cosmetic to that rather than have somebody else who may not be as trained walk around the car for 30 seconds? You're saving time. There's no movement of the car. It's already happening. That's multitasking right there, saving yourself time and people energy. All right, so just some examples of going lean. We wanted to give you guys some things that you could take away today besides uh, um, you know, besides the obvious, but some easy things that you can do that might help you save some time. There was a store that actually took a, uh, a light and they put it above the restroom in their shop. So when somebody went into the West restroom, because it was a, a you know, one-person type restroom, um, the, the door would be locked and somebody would travel all the way across the shop just to use the restroom only to find out the door was locked passing people, going through the, you know, how was your weekend, and, you know, they burn up 10, 15 minutes just trying to get there only to find out somebody was already in there. So they put a light above the restroom and tied that to a motion sensor inside the, um, the restroom on the switch, so if somebody was in, the light was on, and they wouldn't waste their time walking back, back and forth between the shop. Uh, another idea is detailing carts. We go into stores, and I see so many detail departments that have got a cabinet or a bench, and it's loaded with stuff. And the detailers are running back and forth to this bench all day long, I mean, 30, maybe 40 trips. It may not seem like much because it's 10 feet, it's 15 feet. Add that up with uh, how many vehicles they detail a day and how many trips they make. I actually did this in a store. 
we were able to detail one more car per week. We got rid of the bench, we got rid of the cabinet, and we, we gave them mobile carts that they load up and they have everything that they need. To Anthony's point about um, streamlining a reconditioning process where you have different levels of that, um, it might even make sense to have multiple carts depending on what type of detail you're actually doing. Do yourself a favor and don't go down to Harbor Freight and buy the $85 metal cart because you will have a $400 policy expense so fast your head will spin because somebody's going to run that metal cart into the side of a car. Um, go to Home Depot, get the, um, get the Rubbermaid cart. They're a little bit more expensive. They're quite a bit more expensive. I think they're about $150. It will save you the, the heartache of scratching a car uh, with, yep. those, with those soft sides. Um, order cards. So... Here's the scenario. Uh, detailer needs supplies, not always at his, uh, at his post, or he's always in a car when either an outside vendor comes in or a supply sergeant comes around to see what he needs. So he's got to stop what he's doing and get that stuff ordered. With order cards, what they are is they, they have the product that, that you have approved uh, to be used in your department on the card, and they're next to, to the supply, and then they've got the name of the detailer on the back, and they're, they're laminated. It takes a little while to set them up, but big time savings. As the detailer needs these, these products, as they get low, they'll just pull the order card and throw it into a little box. And then when the vendor or the supply sergeant comes around, they just pick the cards up, take them back, place the order. When the order comes in, they check the order in with the supply cards and puts the supply cards and the supplies back, all without interrupting your detailer. This can save you big time as, as it comp compounds. Uh, let's see here. The cosmetic inspection is part of the MPI. That's what I talked about uh, previously. But don't be afraid to include those two uh, inspections together. It makes it a lot easier, too, for your internal writer who's gathering the estimate because right in front of him, once he gets the inspection back from that technician, now he's putting together the multi-point inspection or CPO inspection, and he's got the cosmetic right there. That's going to prevent a lot of going back and forth with the sales department when uh, you may have discovered something's going to need a little bit more cosmetic work than uh, you thought. Standardize your detail process. Don't be afraid to tell your detailers exactly what to do step by step. That's going to add some interchangeability. So if they always know that the first thing they do is you know, clean the outside, then the next thing is the shop back. If you're going to buff, start at 12 o'clock at the front bumper and then work clockwise. Don't be afraid to hold them accountable to that because number one, that's going to help you guys grade and it's going to help for quality control. Number two, if someone's got a drop to leave, or someone's got to drop to take over a delivery for a sale, someone else can pick up that detail and know exactly what was done without having to research and go through the entire car to see what was done and it was not. So standardizing the detail process to include supplies, how you stack your cart, when to use what chemicals, how much of each chemical, have it all doctrinated. That way it's really easy for your onboarding of your new employees and to hold the current ones accountable. And formalize the inspection workflow. Same principle, but on the inspection side, make sure that your internal service writer is looking at the same thing every time. If you don't have a standardized uh, inspection sheet for used cars, maybe alter it a little bit for CPOs or any type of variances there, but if it's not the same thing every time, all you're doing is inviting your internal writer to have to go back to the technician, hey, what did you mean by this? What did you mean by that? But if you formalize it, and it, he's looking at the same thing every time, and the same specs are always filled out, it's just going to be that much quicker and easier to streamline it right into an estimate for the used card department to look at. Next, standardize your workflow. So first you want to define your workflow. Obviously uh, for reconditioning workflow is from the point that you're given the green light go, which is usually if a, a purchase arrives or a trade is cleared, to the point that's ready to go to that front line ready. You want to identify what does it take and who's involved to get that process done. So you're going to want to map out your processes. But don't be afraid to just uh, talk about – can you show the next slide, please? Yep. Don't be afraid to just talk about uh, the specific processes as far as the activity. And on this slide I have on right now, you can see uh, activity, repair order, vehicle, keys – Look at the physical stuff too, not just what you're tracking, but physically what's involved. From the point of inspection, approval, service, detail, frontline ready, are you tracking where the car is parked? Are you tracking where the keys should be? Where the vehicle uh, repair order is? And who is the owner for each of those steps? Once you start getting a hand on, handle on what the triggers are for moving one to the next, you start defining your process and your workflow. Don't be afraid to actually map out the area. You can actually get a map 
of where you want things parked. That helps a lot too. Imagine doing a lot audit and as you're walking around without looking at your mobile phone or any paperwork, you can get an idea of what's in the queue. Okay, those cars parked over there and are they ready for detail? Are those over there still haven't been inspected yet? So designate parking areas. Put some signs up on your light poles or chain link fence or whatnot and, and have the staff train that when they're done with their particular role, they may have to move it to a next spot. And imagine the time saved from a detailer having to hit that panic or lock button on the fob trying to figure out where the car's parked where he can just beeline and know exactly where, to, uh, where it is because it's a designated area. So map out your area. And it doesn't just have to be inside, uh, outside. It can be inside as well. Perhaps you guys have a certain workflow in, inside your building. That's, that's worth putting down too. When you guys are able to map these things out, your, your workflow, your processes, and your area, everybody can get on the same sheet of music. You're all looking at the same thing. Well, and in addition to that, Anthony, I think you know in this in this particular store, one of the big advantages was that the the maps were built based on where the operations were done. People weren't even having to walk as far. Exactly. You know, you're you're saving wasted time of movement, which is one of the biggest wastes in business. All right. So some of the core reconditioning problems. Um, you know, we've defined these to be the five core reconditioning problems that that dealerships need to overcome. You know, the blame and the finger pointing. Um, it's always somebody else's fault. The techs blame the parts, the writers blame the tax. Parts blames the used car manager for not getting enough approval, not getting the approvals in on time, and the photographers blame the detail. I mean, it's really common. We see it. Uh, delay. Uh, why, why do stores wait until the vehicle's in the service bay to order tires and windshields when we know the tires were bald and the windshield was cracked when it was being appraised? That just it blows my mind, but I see it all the time. Um, Communication. Uh, with today's margins, dealerships have fewer people doing more things, which makes it harder to pen them down for answers. Uh, we've got text messages, emails, sticky notes. Uh, I told James to tell you and he forgot and just real uh, nasty communication going on everywhere. Uh, um, and the shifting priorities and waste of time. Uh, the approval process can be a burden to used car managers who are trying to sell a car and hold gross. And uh, let's see, uh, someone else is changing, let's see. So if someone else is chasing them down with a, with an estimate to spend money on something else, they'll push off the approval to close the deal, and the bottle and that will bottleneck the recon process with, and without realizing it. Um, you know the the other the other um, the other delay would be the service department pushing off uh, internal work for for customer pay work. It happens all the time because they don't have it they don't have it dedicated. Uh, and then pro, uh, profit opportunity. Uh, dealerships will often sublet work because uh, it's it's what the industry has always done. Uh, su uh, sublet cosmetic work because it's what the industry has always done. We don't uh, we we don't see many used car techs performing windshield chip repairs, and that blows my mind uh, because 70% of the cars have windshield chips, and the tools necessary to do windshield chip repairs you can get into a very decent kit for somewhere between you know three and four hundred dollars. But yet every tech that that I visit's got a you know three hundred dollar snap on impact gun in there, but nobody's fixing windshield trip repairs, so it just kind of blows my mind that um, you know you're losing that that opportunity. Okay, let's see. I scrolled. Sorry about that. Next slide. All right, some solutions. Yeah, we didn't want to just tell you about all the problems because you know those. So put um, some solutions. You definitely want to come up with a digital tracking and communication solution. You want to get away from the days of just putting a repair order on someone's desk or filing it somewhere for the next person or even getting away from the whiteboard. You want to have something digital that everybody has access to, whether it's a website, a cloud-based service, maybe a shared Google Docs or something like that. You need something. You want to be able to look at something, have everyone else look at that, and know exactly how many cars you have in what stage and what needs to be happening next. Preferably, you would also want to combine that with some type of communication solution. Got to go digital, okay? So don't, don't leave the voicemails and make the phone calls. Have some sort of texting, email option, or again, some sort of cloud-based uh, note-taking where you can leave a note on a particular car and, and uh, the next person who needs to know what's going on can read it. But you definitely want to have something that everybody can access, all the key players can access and see live information at the same time. So manage your in-betweens, and here's what I mean by that. Stores are probably pretty good at fixing a car when they're fixing it, or detailing a car when they're detailing it. 
But what's going on in between those? And when the car's ready for detail and it's sitting out in the parking lot, who knows that? When it's ready for service, who knows that? So manage those in-betweens. That's the stuff that's costing us days, days and days. Um, good, better, best parts options with shipping. You know, the days of uh, having a counterman look up the parts and go, well, you told me to look up all the aftermarket parts, so that's the only thing I'm going to do, and that's what I'm going to put on the estimate, so here's how much it's going to be. You know, it's that uh, do you want it or don't you approach. Those days are gone. Uh, you know, with with, uh, with us realizing what it's costing us per day to keep these vehicles in stock, it very well may be cheaper to pull the OE part off the shelf and put it on the car than to wait for an aftermarket option if 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 the spread is there. Um, so you know, I urge I urge people to give good, better, best options and um, put shipping in there. It might be cheaper to get that aftermarket part if we can overnight it for seven bucks, but it's not if we have to overnight it for twenty. So you know, give people some options so that. We can really focus on um, doing what's what's less expensive, not necessarily what's just cheaper. Okay. Have a dedicated approval process. Make sure whoever's uh, giving the approval is is getting presented the same thing every single time. What you don't want is a whole bunch of variation. In variation, you got a lot of mistakes, right? So if it's whether it's a, a digital version, like I talked about earlier, or if it is pre presentation of a repair order. Or text message, email, whatever it is, do the same thing every single time. Get that uh, sales desk in the habit of of knowing what to expect, how long it's going to take, and where they have to look for the prices, estimates, etc. Same philosophy can be with your vendors on the reconditioning side. Internally, get that approval process from your vendors to you to be the same way. If one guy's leaving a voicemail, another guy's an email, this guy's texting. Get them all on the same page. That way, the internal estimate team they can have the the standardization and speed because there's no variation. Go ahead and have detail, variable work, and pricing. Went into it in depth earlier, but that's key because it's going to save time in the decision making of the detailers. It's going to help with your uh, what you charge the sales department, and it's going to make it a lot easier for your estimator. Have it uh, have things pre-planned like operation codes and pricing. Don't put yourself in a position where someone can question, well, why did that alignment cost more last time than this time? Standardize uh, your, your work and pricing and offer detail var uh, variable detailing. So we've got some stores that are actually going away from the approval process. So when, when we say um, you know, be consistent with your approval process, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have one. Um, and I'm not saying that you give somebody a blank check, but by the same token, uh, there are stores that are, are being have been very successful recently with putting thresholds on cars. If it's got this many miles and it's this old, this is how much money you can allot for reconditioning. So there, there's tiers there, and they can they can self-authorize. And then anything over a certain amount, uh, you know, they can come back to the well for. Cutting down the, that that time that it's actually taking to get those approvals back is literally cutting days out of reconditioning. And while you might not think a two hour delay could cause you uh, 18 hours in reconditioning, if a tech's got a vehicle on a hoist and he's got to take it down to wait for approval, he's going to start something else. And he's not going to pull that other car back in when he gets the approval. He's going to pull it in when he has time. So that two hour delay could cost you a ton of time in reconditioning. So eliminating that could be, um, could be a big time saver for you. Got to do it right though. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, where, where, where was I? Uh, internalizing cosmetic reconditioning. Now, I just I just talked to that uh, a few slides ago, so I won't spend much time there. Uh, but there are minor operations. Even if you don't bite, you know, bite the big bullet. Take just take a big uh, chunk out of that elephant and do stuff that you can do in your service departments. We get that you can't do all of it, but consider things like rock chip repair. Um, PDR, some things that you can do, uh, you know, without a without a body shop there. Have a dedicated internal staff. Okay, make sure that you're not uh, having people compete with themselves. So if you got a, a service writer who also does internal, of course they're going to prioritize CP or something that is more directly tied to their pay plan. But if you have an internal dedicated staff, detailers just for the reconditioning, techs just for the used cars, you'll find that they're going to work faster and streamline the process, which feeds the sales department more cars and gets the whole inventory turning uh, as a whole faster. So have a dedicated internal staff. And if you can't because you're short manned, then at least have a dedicated process so that they understand the priorities. 
handle this internal work before you move on to this next ticket. So the chaser, let's talk about that person for a minute. Um, typically where we see stores get to the volume where they need what we call a chaser is somewhere between, well, let's say anywhere over about 75 cars a month. And the chaser is somebody who works for the used car department or, or works for variable, but they spend almost all of their time in fixed. Um, think of it as having a dedicated rep in the, the service department and body shop and parts departments that have the interests of the used car department at heart. Their main goal is to keep that car moving. And this is somebody with a little bit of authority. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a very expensive position. Um, these are typically uh, lot people that were lot techs that showed a, a big interest in growing within the automotive industry and in the company and want to move on to that next step. Uh, but their job is to keep that car moving and they, they will have a little bit of authority to make approvals on, on um, repair costs that might start to get a little expensive, things that could keep your used car manager free to desk deals, uh, you know, move units, spend time at the auction, um, but also with the ability to understand that if something's held up, if there's a huge bottleneck in uh, your cosmetic department, let's use, let's use uh, Body Shop as an example or, or um, cosmetic reconditioning as an example, they have the authority to grab that vehicle, pull it, and sublet it and, and override the department head so that the, uh, the interest of the dealership are at heart here. Pay plans tied to average days in recon. Time is money, so really to get the point across, especially for your dedicated internal staff, why don't you compensate them to the time? Find a way to track how long it's taking cars to get through, rap, uh, through uh, reconditioning and then compensate them or have bonus tiers. Hey, if you guys get this under 10 days, you get this, five days, etc. It will, it will help get them uh, involved in the process. They'll start to have a lot more attention on how long the cars are taking and they'll get a sense of ownership on the entire process, especially your uh, internal admin, the service manager and the, uh, the writer because you know they'll get to that ticket that much sooner rather than wait next wait to the next day to get to it quality control when you have a shared standardized process more people can uh, dip in and look at it and compare it to what the standard should be if you have some sort of digital tracker that everyone can access or some sort of communication hub well now you're seeing what everyone else is doing and the sales department can see what reconditioning is doing uh, if they have the same form formalized estimates you can quality control that you can quality control the physical work of the detailers have someone go in after make sure that they hit the standard because you know that the detailer is doing the same thing every time because that's the way you train them so now double check uh, if the detailer is the last person that is looking at that car before it hits that uh, lot you're trusting that they're commenting on their own work before a customer sees it for a, a test drive so it's, it'd be smart to include someone in there for quality control so um, just a comment to quality control, you know, I go into stores quite often and what do I see? I see checklists everywhere and they drive me insane uh, because typically what, what will a technician do with the checklist? They'll take the pen from the top of the list and draw a straight line right down through everything green and then throw it in a basket. Checklists to me are a huge waste of time. If you're, you're doing quality control, line out the process so that the people understand what's expected of them. If something's wrong, go back to that person and the, uh, the expectation is that I expect you to check this off. If it's not right, we're going to have a conversation. I don't need a piece of paper to say that you signed this to say that this, you know, this was good. It's a, it's a huge uh, waste of time and then filing and keeping track of all that stuff. So get rid of the paper. Um, and then lastly, uh, cosmetic damage analysis and continued education. If you don't have an internal body shop, and you sublet this, and this will also work if you do, um, but if you sublet your body work, I would urge you to get a hold of the body shop that you sublet your work to and ask them, would you mind coming in once a quarter and meeting with my sales staff and discussing with us on how to identify damage? It will be to your benefit because if your sales staff can pick out that damage when they're appraising the car, they can properly UA that trade and then, and then um, plan for how much money they're going to have to spend on that reconditioning rather than buying the car, thinking you have a good piece, and then finding out that you're going to have to spend thousands of dollars so you end up wholesaling it. It will be to their advantage to come and train you how to look for, um, for signs of, of, of wrecked vehicles so you can properly UA those things. And then lastly, change implementation. It's the hardest thing in a store to do, to, to launch something and then how do you get it to stick? 
the stores that are most successful with change implementation in uh, in dealerships they meet regularly usually Tuesday mornings um, huddle up the reconditioning team Tuesdays are great because Mondays all of the trades are there from the previous weekend people are scrambling to get things in so to uh, to meet with everybody and, and find out where everybody's at is just not not reasonable but Tuesdays they've got through all those trades they're in the shop they got a pretty good idea of, of what the next few days are going to look like meet for for 10 to 15 minutes talk about what's working and what isn't and then anything that the team needs to know right there um, don't turn these into we have to reinvent the wheel meetings keep them real short and brief uh, if you are measuring things bring your metrics to your meeting so you can see uh, how things are going if you made a change previously bring those metrics so you can see if the change that you made was effective they not always we're in the car business a lot of this is trial and error I mean, you're not going to be successful every single time you try it so you know make the change bring the metrics to the meeting if it's not working change it again it's okay and, and be patient okay this is not just a something else to do this is this is a change you're changing the culture uh, so it, it takes a while you know you're not you're not quickly steering a car you're more like steering a battleship but once you get it in the right direction it's now embedded in the culture and it's something you can count on and look for small things to change it's okay to change a thousand things one percent rather than try and change one thing a thousand percent I know you can't change it a thousand percent but that's a good good analogy anyway so I think Brian I think we're good we want to open that up to any questions that people would have yeah hey everybody this is Brian again um, if you have questions please type them in now and we will get to them we do have a few questions already in um, how can we use spiffs or bonuses to reduce finger pointing? Anthony, do you want to take that? Sure. So I would say right off the bat, if you know some of the major finger pointing is usually time. You know, too often I hear, "Well, I I could sell more cars if I can get more cars out of recon faster." Um, and if you're tracking. Uh, if you're tracking how fast the cars are going through and everyone's motivated, then that's not an issue anymore. A lot of times I found that the sales department, uh, you know, they're, all they want is to fill their lot. And if you fill their lot, they're happy. Uh, everything else comes secondary to that. So get everybody involved with reconditioning. Like I said, uh, have their pay plans tied to the cycle time, to the ADR, average days of recon, however you want to term it, but have the skin in the game so they understand that look, hey, the weekend's coming. We better get these cars out so they can get sold. Uh, no one wants to sell a car out of a bullpen or before it's been cosmetically reconditioned or even inspected. So some of the main finger pointing of me not getting my cars on time or uh, uh, or anything along the lines of time can easily be solved by pay plans tied to the uh, average days in recon. All right. Our our next question, Anthony and Anthony, is. Should the used car manager order windshields and tires, or should more people have that authority? I, I can answer that. Um, I guess it's going to depend on your volume. If I think if you're a 75 car or less store, um, used car managers can uh, request windshields and tires from maybe a, a lead service writer. I don't think they necessarily need to call the vendors, and 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 I certainly would not recommend uh, ordering tires straight from a tire store, even by the I'm going to recommend the chaser if you're over 75 units a month, um, but I wouldn't recommend the tra chaser ha have enough power to pick up the phone and call the, uh, you know, the tire store and order them. These are going to be an investment that the parts department is going to make. They're going to be accountable for making that purchase. The order needs to go to the parts department, and then parts can can generate that order. But anything over 75 units, I think it's completely acceptable uh, if you've got a chaser that's empowered while you're doing trade walk to uh, to order that windshield and and those tires right from there. All right. Our, our next question is, should we stock our make windshields to speed recon of common trades? Okay. Um, I'm going to say no. Um, on gl Glass is just such a, a, a touchy... Uh, a, a touchy subject. Now, if you now if you're a BMW dealer, a dealer, a Mercedes dealer, yes. Um, why? Because there's not a lot of aftermarket glass out there, and uh, as long as as your as as the glass meets your phase in fa your phasing criteria, yes, you should stock it. Uh, if it's uh, you know if you're talking about a, a 15 Chevrolet Silverado, 
There's probably a thousand of those windshields in Salt Lake City right now waiting to go into trucks. Um, you can have those to your dealership within a day. Just get them ordered while you're doing your trade walk. Hey, actually, you know what? A, a follow-up to that is, is what, how would you answer that same question about tires? It's exactly the same way. Um, exactly the same way. If, uh, if if you're if you're a BMW or Mercedes dealer, you've got directional. Uh, you, you've got you know, directional tires for cars. Your customer pay business. You're selling you're selling those tires. Providing that those tires meet your phase in criteria, I'm, I'm not going to recommend that you go out on a whim and go. Uh, you know, we need tires for these cars in case we in case we need them. My big my big push for ordering these up front is for that exact reason. Some of the stuff might be hard to get, and it's going to take a day or two, and that's why you need to be cognizant of that lead time and getting these things ordered early. All right. Um, we had another question come in. Is it possible to have this PowerPoint sent to me for staff review? Yes. Yes, it is. Absolutely. We, that. we just, we, just um, we need your information. We'd be happy to get that to you. And for everybody that's on, the, on this webinar right now, this is, um, you're going to get an email from me. It'll be brian at autosuccessonline.com thanking you for attending. And that is an automated email, but that is my real email address. So if you reply to that directly asking for the PowerPoint, um, or for that matter, the recording. Um, if there's somebody in the dealership that you feel would benefit from watching this, this uh, webinar, you, know, you can request a recording too, and I'll make sure that Anthony and Anthony get it out to you. Um, it looks like that's the, all the questions that we have right now. Uh, I'll encourage anybody that's on the on the webinar. If you have another question, please ask it now, uh, because we'll be wrapping up if we don't get any more questions in. Um, Anthony and Anthony, um, is there anything that you would anything more you would like to share with our audience before we let them go? I didn't rehearse the anything more, Brian. So I think I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Well, guys, thank you for taking the time to join us. You know, to, to present this great information today. I hope to have you. At, on again in the future. Um, to everybody in the audience, if you feel that you learned something from this webinar, please, you know, take the time to join us again in the future. And if you and if you feel like you learned a lot of this webinar, please pay us a compliment by recommending it to other people that you know at your dealership and other people that are in the industry. This is Brian Ankey with Auto Success and Babcock Media. Thank you for coming and I hope to see you again sometime soon. Thanks, Brian. Thank you.